you for coming. My name is Philip Chang. I am a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Zurich. And it is my great pleasure to present to you today our paper titled Shocks to Transition Risk, co-authored with Christoph Meinerding and Yves Schüler. Both are at Deutsche Bundesbank. So what is this paper about? Basically, the purpose of this paper is to measure shocks to transition risk. So the motivation for that, I guess, should be quite clear. So we all know of the importance of climate change and the importance of understanding how climate change will affect society. An established way of thinking about risks um, stemming from climate change is the distinction between physical risk and transition risks. So of course, physical risks are like more frequent extreme weather events, hurricanes, heat waves, all of that, which physically damages the economy, while transition risks are thought of as risks that come from the process of adjusting the economy towards a lower carbon level, phasing out carbon intensive industries like oil or coal, and how this process in general can affect the entire economy at large. Why did we choose transition risk for our paper, well, in a nutshell, we don't really know that much about it. There's a very large literature on physical risks and how they can affect the economy, like not, not only in the natural sciences, but also in social sciences, economics. Um, I mean, yes, you all know about that. But we don't really have an equivalent for transition risk. In particular, we kind of lack a concise definition of what transition risk actually is. At least we haven't seen anything yet from, from major policymakers in that direction. Also, since the concept of transition risk is relatively more abstract than physical risk, it's actually more challenging to get a precise measurement of transition risk. So in our paper, we propose exactly a method to measure shocks to transition risk, meaning um, we want to find instances with significant new information on possible transition paths of the economy. Our approach consists of a combination of two different methods. First, we look at uh, equity prices, so meaning uh, the price or differential pricing of green and brown firms in the sense, okay, green firms, carbon friendly firms and brown firms or carbon intensive firms. We form long short portfolios of brown minus green and we look at access, at access returns. In the second step, we combine these returns with the news regarding climate change in conjunction with economics. And I'll talk about uh, why we actually need both approaches uh, later on. The result of this two-step procedure will be a time series um, consisting of shocks to transition risks. And what can we do with that? I mean, of course, economic analysis. We plug this time series into a fairly standard uh, macro financial VAR model consisting of like uh, major economic variables, we build a small model of the economy and we analyze the impact of our transition risk shocks on these uh, variables with impulse responses and uh, valence decompositions. Our methodology identifies in total seven relevant shocks in a sampling period from 2010 to 2018. We can group these shocks into five shocks increasing transition risk and two shocks decreasing transition risk. I'll explain how we arrive at this distinction later. Of course, um, the work we are presenting here today is fairly preliminary and only for the US market as of now. Um, and of course, I mean, what do we mean with increasing transition risk? So these are basically events or shocks which are favoring a transition towards a carbon neutral economy, while decreasing transition risk shocks are like the opposite, so kind of slowing that down. Huh? Example for decreasing uh, transition risk shocks um, 
are those two. So the one in November 2016 and January 2017. So what happened there? Of course, the election of, of Donald Trump and uh, his, his inauguration and like um, his uh, EPA nominee for the, the Environmental Protection Agency, Scott Pruitt, uh, in January 2017, he first outlined his, his policy for, for the department. It like, became clear that uh, it was not really going to be like very climate friendly in some sense. Huh? Um, yeah, so in, as you can see, the, a, a major feature of our, of our two-step approach is that uh, we can actually label these shocks with, with a certain narrative. By going to the news, reading newspaper articles, we can, can actually get a, a, a context for these shocks and uh, in some sense be a little bit more certain that we're actually measuring the right thing. As another feature of our approach, um, we uh, can actually see that there are certain events that are not actually transition risks or not actually significant according to our methodology, even if like intuitively a priori one would have expected them to show up. Our prime example for this is July 2017, which uh, was the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. So I mean, a major event in terms of climate news, but not significant. So we think that this event was like not exogenous to, to, to the economy and was already widely anticipated after the election of Trump. I mean, uh, he campaigned on, 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 on the basis of, of like um, yeah, removing the US from, from this, as he called it, unfair agreement. And by the time he was elected, people already expected him to take some action on that sooner or later. So by the time it happened, it actually didn't change anything on the market anymore. So as I said, given our shocks, we plugged them into a macro financial VAR model. And here we have uh, our first preliminary results for the US market. We first see that shocks increasing transition risk have a significant aggregate impact on industrial production. So we see a significant decrease in industrial production within 12 months. Computing a um, forecast area variance decomposition, we see that these shocks explain up to 22% of total variation of industrial production during the first year. Similarly, we see that a positive shock increases financial stress and also credit risk premium with up to 29% of total variation explained by our shock. So I should mention at this point that the numbers for the variance uh, decomposition that are given here are to be interpreted more as an, as an upper bound. Um, as you will see later, we estimate two schemes in our VAR model, one a little bit more conservative, one a little bit more liberal. And um, for the more conservative scheme, uh, the numbers are so uh, significant, but slightly lower. So we kind of see this as like an upper bound and a lower bound for, for the true results, which are somewhere in between. We also conduct a similar exercise with uh, sectoral industrial production. And there we see basically what we would expect in this context. So we see a lower industrial production of energy materials and transit equipment. And this is quite intuitive. You know, think of energy materials as, as oil and coal and all these types of, of dirty industries. Huh? Um, this kind of convinces us even more that like, what we're measuring is goes, goes into the right direction. Huh? So again, we see up to 27% of the um, variance explained by our shocks. Um, and also in a separate model, we look at equity volatility of uh, a selection of sectors of the US economy, conduct a similar exercise. And uh, here again, we see up to 24% of variation in the um, equity volatility of these sectors explained by our shocks. Um, what we also find is within the financial sector, we see that insurance companies are less affected than banks. And finally, we also observe a pronounced non-linearity for our shocks. 
meaning that increases in transition risk have a far stronger, more significant impact on uh, industrial production and other macro variables than decreases. Good, so that's like a bird's eye view of what we do. Now I get into a little bit more detail of how we actually construct our shocks. So, as I said, how do we identify these events? Um, we combine two approaches, on one hand, portfolio analysis or portfolio sorts with texture analysis. And both methods are fairly well known, fairly well established, but uh, combining those two is, uh, to our knowledge, a novel approach. So in our portfolio sorts uh, part of our procedure, we, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fairly standard, yes, yeah, so we, we sort um, our, our companies, we sort them into long short portfolios with um, a sorting variable um, representing some kind of carbon footprint. So basically like carbon emissions and energy usage. Um, and as I said, portfolio sort methodology is fairly widely used, fairly standard, but in the realm of climate finance, uh, I think this is still not I guess too standard uh, uh, a way. Huh? So like relevant papers in this, in this section are, are uh, the one by uh, In Park and Mong from Stanford 2019, as well as the paper by uh, Wilkins and Al 2019. I guess Mark Wilkins actually presented in the seminar last week, so perhaps you talked something about that. Huh? Um, and yeah, so as a result, we get uh, a series of long short portfolio returns, which actually have we have, we have, um, have signs that so we can actually look at whether brown firms perform better on a, in a certain month or whether green firms perform better. Um, and we use this information, this sign-based um, information on uh, in determining the sign of, of our, of our um, news shock or of our, of our transition shock. We then combine um, our portfolio sort data with texture analysis. Here, we use a rather simple approach, meaning that we simply count the number of articles mentioning uh, the words climate change and economics or economy. Huh? A similar approach um, can be found in the paper by uh, Robert Engler, 2019. Um, so the main difference, I believe, is they simply um, they don't include terms like economics or uh, economy and solely focus on climate change related uh, dictionary terms. Huh? Um, I mean, they take the articles from the Wall Street Journal, so I mean, implicitly they have, of course, some kind of economics context, or some economics connection to that, but we are in that respect a little bit more explicit concerning the connection with economics. And uh, by including these search terms, we are actually ensuring that we only count articles that are relevant for our study. Uh, I was just curious, your textual analysis, whether it is literally those terms that you use there? Yes, yes, indeed. So um, I'll also explain a bit later. Um, we, we played around with different dictionaries of different levels of sophistication, but in the end, um, the results didn't really change or didn't change at all. So in the end, we opted for, for simplicity. So we really only used like climate change and economics uh, as, it, as it's written here. Okay, thanks. Can I just ask another question as well quickly? Yes. Um, yes. So am I right in thinking the way to think about this is your textual measure picks up sort of uh, attention in the news, but mm -hmm. you might be worried that that's not salient to firms. And so your portfolio sorts try and capture salience in terms of, okay, is this actually material to firms? Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's, that's the reasoning behind it. So um, I'll explain... Basically, that, that's my next slide. So I'll perhaps okay, cool. Thanks. Go there. So um, yes, exactly. So I mean, yeah, the, 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 the main reason for why we combine these approaches is basically, yeah, a uh, question of robustness. I mean, this is the main concern in this exercise is robustness. There are so many degrees of freedom, uh, and in particular because transition transition risks um, is not very strongly defined in the literature at the moment. So there are many, many different ways to tweak the analysis. And in some sense, we kind of have to tie our hands. Huh? We believe that either approach on its own is 
uh, not stable enough to produce reliable results. First of all, if we only look at portfolio source, um, we take ESG data from Thomson Reuters, ICON, so fairly standard sources. And I mean, if you if you uh, have worked with ESG data before, you most likely know that data availability and data quality in that area is still fairly low, but increasing over the last few years. So it is a bit unclear to us at the moment um, how reliable these values actually are. I'm thinking of like, are these values self-reported? Is there some kind of official source for 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 these um, for these measurements, etc.? So that's one concern. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's I guess it's a basic fact of life that stock market returns are very noisy business and driven by by many many latent factors. So. Uh, I guess the main concern here, if we only use stock market data, would be um, detecting lots and lots of false positives. On the other hand, if we only use textual analysis, we don't really know if the news we are picking up is actually relevant. I mean, there's so much news on climate change and economics in general out there, but most of the time, nothing actually happens at the stock markets. So in that case, it is to our understanding, very unlikely that these events are actually a, a shock to transition risk or any shock whatsoever. And it's also, sorry, it's also possible that these events have also been anticipated before, like for example, the Paris Agreement withdrawal. So I know, Glenn, does, does that answer your question regarding? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, what I just thought of just then as well was the temporal nature of this. So do you look mm -hmm. at, is the, the day you look at the news, is that the same day you look at the returns? Yes, yeah, so um, our, our analysis is on a monthly level. So, um, I mean, it's, of course, always a bit difficult to actually like connect the, those two events. So if something happens on the stock market and you look at the news database. Um, we don't really have this, this kind of granularity in the sense of real time news. Yeah. So um, by looking only on the monthly level, we kind of have a little bit more flexibility in like not confusing events or some causality uh, or some reverse causality issues or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. So, and we believe, as I said, that the combination of those two, two approaches addresses these concerns. On top of that, as I've already said before, um, this dual approach allows some narrative-based labeling of shocks. So kind of also addressing the, the some, some endogeneity concerns. Uh, so if we look, the shocks are mainly like policy events, policy decisions. Uh, um, so and these, these come from outside the economy, these are in a sense exogenous. Uh, and in some way, but this is like preliminary, um, one could interpret this as some kind of distinction between changes to physical and risk neutral expectations. So in the sense that uh, portfolio shocks represent changes to risk neutral expectations, while news shocks are reflecting yeah, more changes in, in physical expectations. Yeah. But as I said, that's a bit preliminary and we'd appreciate any input or any thoughts you'd have uh, on that as well. Okay, good. So, how do we actually sort? Um, we use uh, crisp CompuStat data for stock market returns. We merge it with ESG data from Thomson Reuters Icon, and we do two portfolio sorts. So one using carbon emissions or carbon equivalent emissions as a sorting variable, and a second one um, using energy usage. So and then like standard asset price uh, asset pricing machinery, we form value weighted decile portfolios which are annually rebalanced. We compute farmer fringe three factor residuals for our portfolio returns. And um, yeah, we then simply look at the long short portfolio. So 10 minus one uh, in sense brown and screen. Um, and yeah, get, get a time series for returns or basically two, like one for carbon and one for energy. As a robustness measure, we also uh, include a third carbon portfolio, namely the brown minus green score um, from Gergen et al, 2020 which uh, Mark Wilkins was uh, kind enough to provide us uh, with, this, with this time series. What do we observe? Well, first of all, we see that 
our um, pharma fringe prefactor residuals have relatively little condition heteroscedasticity. Um, of course, we see that um, I mean, since many, many sorting variables are available, we um, decided to, to, to favor simplicity. And as I said before, we simply use carbon and energy. So basically the ones you'd first think of. And we also see in our data the issue of data coverage. So in the sense that if we look at firms in 2005, we only have approximately 100 firms with, with data available on their carbon emissions and like only 50 for energy usage. So like numbers that are absolutely inadequate for any sensible analysis. In 2010, we already uh, have a market increase in that. So 300 firms and 200 for, for carbon and energy uses uh, respectively. And I guess like in 2015, it was like 500 and more than 400 for, for each category. So it's a strong trend. But for that reason, we um, decided to restrict our, our, our sample space for um, to, um, to time periods after 2010, I guess, uh, also like in the uh, Gergen and our 2020 paper, even due to these uh, data availability concerns. So, um, how do we construct a monthly climate news index? So we rely on a news database called Factiva, so which is basically contains like every major uh, newspaper around the globe. So any articles you can search them. Uh, and uh, we limit our analysis to the US market and we look at only the 10 major US newspapers, so like Chicago Tribune, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, you name it. Uh. Um, Factiva allows us to search for certain articles um, using uh, certain search marks of key phrases. And as I said before, we use climate change and economic or economy. So we have these two components. On one hand, uh, this environmental aspect, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, like economic side. So to keep the articles relevant to our analysis. Um, we count the number of articles which contain these, um, these two phrases and get a time series with article counts on a, on a monthly basis. Um, furthermore, we standardize this number with the total number of articles about matters economic. So the total number of articles containing the term economic or economy. The reason for that is we simply want to filter out um, effects due to changes in, in, in volume of economics articles. Finally, we also see that um, there's a, a significant positive time trend in our unfiltered news index, which is, I guess, not very surprising since climate change has become significantly more important in public debate over the, the last few years. But to account for that, we apply a, a standard HP filter to eliminate this time trend. We see, furthermore, that um, our news index is more volatile in the second half of, of our sample, so kind of reflecting the, the um, the importance of, of, of climate change in, in, in public discourse. We also see that our news index is very robust to um, the concrete choice of dictionary. So I mean, as I believe I mentioned that before, so we tried a, a multitude of different, uh, different dictionaries, different key phrases in our, in our search. So when we, we looked at like a canon of, of, of climate change literature and got some, some glossaries with certain terms and we would compile that. We looked which words were the most important, were the most often mentioned, played around with that. Um, and in the end, all these indices that we got were highly, highly correlated. So like 98, 99%. So basically we decided to go from simplicity and that will also be our message here should you decide to I know, do something similar. Uh, keep it simple, climate change is uh, enough in, in, in that regard. Okay. And well, and that's, that's our, our first result. That's our climate news index. You see the red detrended line, that's um, our, our standardized and filtered news index. So number of articles, standardized and filtered. The spikes, so here, 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 those um, indicate that something is going on in news cycle. So that are there's many articles written about economics and climate change. Um, our shocks, our seven shocks here, 
those are these, these vertical bars, how are they determined? This relies on a, on a coexistence approach. So we look at months where our filtered climate news index is one standard deviation above its mean. And we look at the months where in at least one of our three portfolios, the returns are either one standard deviation above or one standard deviation below the uh, mean return. And we look simply at those months that in which uh, in like both the news index and the uh, portfolios, something significant is happening. So something with more than a standard deviation uh, for news, uh, less or more than a standard deviation for returns. So kind of coexistence approach. And but this gets us this seven shocks. So these um, uh, solid lines here, one to five, those indicate events where the long short returns are negative in the sense that brown firms underperform relatively to green firms, which we then interpret as an increase in transition risk, while the dashed lines six and seven stand for um, positive returns for our, our long short portfolios, so, firm, uh, so months in which green firms are uh, underperforming relatively to brown firms, which we then, of course, interpret as, uh, as, a, as a decrease in transition risk. Good, so that's how we identify our shocks. Um, any questions for that? I was wondering, is it um, absolute total emissions or relative to size or something like that? You mean the... Uh, the carbon so emissions by which... You have... Yes. Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, I've, I think that it's, it's relative to size, but I have to admit I'm not 100% certain, so I'd have to come back to you, to you on that. So I don't know, Eve, uh, do you remember? Uh, no, I don't know. No, okay. So uh, I, I think it was relative, but uh, I'd have to look it up and come back to you again, okay? Yeah, sure. No, no problem. I think it'll, you know, we can discuss later. It'll be interesting of how to interpret the risk then because yeah. it's a bit of a different thing. Okay. Okay, good. Any, any other questions on that? Okay, good. So now um, we have our, um, our time series with, with shocks. So we, we have identified them. But now, um, I mean, we want to do some economic analysis with that. So we convert our shocks, our, our, our events we've identified into a time series. Um, we start with a, uh, with a series of dummy variables where um, one indicates a month with a positive transition risk shock and minus one uh, indicates a negative transition risk shock. And of course, zero for anything else. Huh? We then scale this time series um, with the value of our, of our um, news index in that specific month. So going back, we uh, look at um, the value that our news index took in the significant months. So like for the first one, we have 0 0.02. Then we multiply the plus one in our time series with this 0 0.02 and so on. So this kind of allows us to I can incorporate uh, in the, uh, the magnitude of a certain, sh of a, uh, certain shock. Huh? This uh, time series, sorry, this time series um, is in use in a small model of the US economy. So we take like a standard Bayesian VR model comprised of uh, eight uh, variables. So basically in some sense representing the entire economy. We have industrial production, we have consumption, we have prices in the form of the PCE deflator. We look at the yield curve with uh, three uh, treasury yields. We look at slope, so 10 minus uh, three uh, yields. So the slope of the yield curve. We also include uh, notions of uh, risk premium on the bond market. So we have the excess bond premium uh, by uh, Gilchrist and Sakrashek, 2012. We also include the VIX as well as um, like market returns in general. Yes, and that's our VAR model. So like following Wagner and Jar, we have uh, our 
And time series are comprised of our shocks and our eight uh, economic variables. We assume that our shock is, is uh, exogenous. However, we um, are flexible with respect to whether our shocks have uh, contemporaneous uh, influences on the, on the other variables. So for that reason, um, we specify two different models. So like the difference will be uh, with this matrix on the uh, left-hand side. So in our first specification, TR1, we say that our matrix A is upper triangular, meaning that our transition risk shocks are fully exogenous to the economy. While in a second specification, which we call TR2, A is a lower triangular matrix, which would allow for contemporaneous endogeneities. Yes, um, exactly. So our model, um, we use up to 12 lakhs in our model, so like 12 months, one year. And for estimation, we use like a standard uh, Minnesota prior or like random walk prior for, for, for our model. So yeah, it's, that's a very standard approach in this context now. So now here you can see the first set of our results. Um, so these impulse responses are for an increase in, uh, in transition risk under the uh, TR1 scheme. So say in some sense more liberal. Huh? Um, and as I've mentioned before, the um, values that you see here are to be thought of more as an, as an upper bound. We don't show pictures here for TR2, but the effects are uh, same, a bit smaller, but still significant, especially for industrial production. And as we can see, US IP, US industrial production, decreases actually quite a bit um, in response to a positive shock to transition risk. We can also see um, a, a decrease in the slope of uh, the, um, the term structure. And here, so, and we also see an increase in credit risk premia on the bond market, as well as an increase in the VIX and um, a reduction of stock market returns in general. So and this picture kind of indicates or suggests that our shocks are of contractionary nature. They increase financial stress as well as credit risk premium. So in this table here, um, that's for the same analysis, we, we show the, the forecast error variance decompositions. So under, under, both, uh, under both regimes and both for increasing and decreasing uh, shocks. And uh, as I've mentioned in the introduction, we have two very significant effects here. So industrial production, um, here 21.5% of its, of its circle variation is explained by uh, a positive shock to transition risk on average over the first year. And for the excess bond premium, we actually have like up to 29.2%. Um, under the more conservative scheme, we still have uh, very strong um, numbers here. So 9.2 9 for industrial production as well as 12.5 for the excess bond premium. Yes. Um, we also see here, like as I said before, kind of this, this non-linearity. So for a decrease, we don't really see uh, effects on, 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 on the same magnitude as, as one increase. So, yes. Okay. In a second exercise, we um, replace aggregate industrial production for the US with a more granular sectoral industrial production. So um, we plug in time series for 22 sectoral industrial productions. And here on the slide, we show um, the three most interesting and most significant effects. We see that an increase in transition risk under the tier one scheme um, leads to a significant decrease um, in industrial production for energy materials, as well as business equipment industrial and other and business equipment transit. And I guess like in some sense, these are somewhat reassuring results uh, again in the sense that it kind of confirms that what we are measuring is goes into the right direction. Here we see for the same exercise, our forecast error valency compositions again. Um, so basically the same table. table. Uh, 
And here again, for the three sectors that I um, had before, we have these very strong um, percentages of explainability for total variation. No? Are there any sectors that benefit from an increase um, in transition risk? So, so like uh, information technology, or I'm thinking of green energy. I don't know if you have a refined sector like, uh, you know, solar energy, things like that, they should actually profit. Mm -hmm. In principle, I would agree with you. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a, 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 um, that, that, that fine a, a classification for our sectors. So I guess um, I would expect that if we kind of, kind of get data for like a more, more, more granular, uh, on a more granular level, we would actually see these effects. But uh, here we didn't observe something like that. I guess for most sectors, um, the responses were fairly flat. Yeah, so there wasn't really anything happening here. And for that reason, we were kind of like uh, um, more reassured that it was happening like in these general like energy material sectors of what you would think of um, in the sense of like coal and oil, which are still, I guess, dominating the energy market in the United States. Um, yeah, but, but I agree, yeah. So, um, I guess that's that's a good uh, good point to to uh, look further into yeah. So, in another exercise, we um, looked at industry portfolio uh, return variances. So, um, we simply uh, took the sum of, of squares for daily returns from the seventeen pharma French industry portfolios. Um, one of these portfolios is actually titled financials, which we then um, like further split up into in the sub-financial sectors, namely banks, insurance, real estate, and financial trading, and to get a kind of more, more granular financial classification here. We also included in, in this exercise the um, NFCI sub-indices. So the NFCI um, is the National Financial uh, Conditions Index published by the Chicago Fed on a, on a weekly basis, which yeah, kind of measures like uh, financial conditions and financial uh, stress on, on the markets. And they also provide us with, um, with sub-indices, so kind of indicating where that stress is coming from. And we have like credit, leverage, non-financial leverage, and risk. And what we see um, in our impulse responses is, again, as you kind of would expect, like the, the, the usual culprits, uh, um, we see a market increase in return volatility for the oil sector, for steel, as well as chemicals. Um, finally, um, when we look into our financial portfolios, we see that banks, I mean, it's a very small effect, um, but we see a, a small increase in, uh, in volatility after, after two months. And we also see um, a market uptick in uh, credit risk. However, we don't observe something similar for, uh, for, for the risk or, or or leverage uh, indices in the, in the NFCI. Also, we don't see uh, a noticeable uptick or a noticeable movement in the insurance sector uh, return volatilities, which we interpret as um, like the insurance sector being more prone to physical risk rather than transition risk. But I guess once you would have to look like further and puker studies to actually confirm this. Um, Again, here, uh, same table, um, we see significant, uh, significant portion of variation in these return uh, variances is explained by our, by our positive shocks. So oil, chemical, steel, banks, and uh, the credit uh, component of the NFCI. Again, the same pattern, we have um, a less strong approach for the more cons conservative specification and we have a certain non-linearity for positive and negative shocks. Okay, good. So um, as I've stated before, this is uh, an exercise which is very, um, yeah, since it's, uh, we, we need to ensure that that robustness is actually achieved. So when we, we uh, looked at different news indices, uh, so um, different dictionaries played around with that, we took different portfolio sorts. So we took our carbon portfolio, we took our, our energy portfolio, and we included our, the uh, Drama and Green portfolio from, from uh, Gergen et al. 
we repeated also our analysis, leaving individual shocks out, so like some kind of leave one out approach uh, to see if like any one single shock had an excessive uh, amount of influence on, on, on our results. And we also allowed for uh, contemporaneous impacts of uh, our shocks on, uh, on the macrofinancial variables. So I guess in some sense, we could say that, that our results are fairly robust due to these different uh, precautionary measures that, that we took here. But of course, there are still a number of further challenges. So I mean, considering data availability, we took our, our, um, our ESG uh, uh, values from, from Icon, but as I've said before, they still have like fairly little coverage. So uh, there's a lot left to be desired. Um, and of course, like in general, the whole matter of ESG scores and all those numbers, it's kind of it's a fairly nascent business, fairly nascent industry. And we can see that many ESG scores are actually very weakly correlated across data providers. So one has to ask oneself how much information actually is in those. Huh? Um, yeah, like another point is, okay, we use Factiva in a fairly simplistic way. So Factiva wouldn't uh, allow us to like download articles on a larger scale or to convert them into kind of Signed of uh, metadata format, so we we don't have like the uh, methods available to conduct like some more sophisticated text analysis using uh, modern machine learning techniques. Huh? Um, on the other hand, as I said, due to the robustness of, of our news index to to um, to different choices of dictionaries, one might actually uh, yeah actually perhaps expect that that these results don't actually really depend on how sophisticated the, the selection algorithm actually is. So in that case, it may actually be true that like a simpler, simpler approach may, may yield at least as good results. So, um, yeah, and of course, portfolio sorts, that's always kind of a kind of a, a messy business, you know, so there are many degrees of freedom. Um, yeah. But in the end, I guess the main challenge that, that we that we had here was there is simply no formal definition of transition risk available on, on the academic market right now. So in a sense, we don't really have a way to validate our measurements. So. Our next steps that we want to take is, okay, we want to repeat our analysis for the other G7 countries. I mean, the Christoph and Yves Bundesbank, they, they, of course, we have to do the same analysis also for the, for the Eurozone. And so I guess we kind of start with G7. Huh? Um, then we want to also replace uh, our icon data with like uh, a more diverse and richer data source. So we sort of, for example, looking at ISS data. And finally, we also um, want to further robustify our approach and especially demonstrate of why our combined approach, so portfolio sorts plus text analysis, yields uh, superior results to um, that, let's say more simpler approaches uh, using only let's say one of those two. Huh? So in order to, to justify the, the complexity of our, of our approach here. So in summary, um, we presented today a news-based identification method for shocks to transition risk, which consisted of a combination of texture analysis and uh, classical portfolio sort methods, which then gave us with a, a number time series of uh, shocks to transition risk in general. This combination was supposed to reduce the degrees of freedom and robustify um, our results. We find, on one hand, that shocks to transition risk have a uh, pronounced aggregate and sectoral impact on the macroeconomy, and they also affect financial stability. And we also observe that there is a significant asymmetry between positive and negative shocks to transition risk. Okay, so um, with that, I'd like to conclude uh, the, uh, my, my presentation here. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'd now be very happy to take your, your questions. So. I think we did not use so adjusted um, data, like emission data, but we control basically for the SNB factor, right? Um, I don't know. Um, so if that so solves the problem in the end, but I guess, um, yeah, so can, can you explain again? So, 
So you said that there are two major con or major consequences. Um, if we did, already. Um, that's to me, right? Hi, Eve. Yeah. Yeah. Guess, yeah. yeah. So, um, so thanks for getting back on that. Well, there's um, if you take absolute emissions, right? You'll have um, in well, in the U.S., it's going to be something like a power producer, right? Definitely, like way, 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 way above all the other companies, right? So because on, in absolute terms, they, they emit like maybe a thousand times more, more carbon, um, right? And, and, and if you, so that's with between sectors, but then even more within sectors, right? If you, if you stay within maybe the power producers, uh, you'll have just, basically that says the big producers have more risk than the small producers, even if they do exactly the same thing. True, yeah. Right, and 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 normally, like if you if you think about the risk in terms of you know a potential carbon tax, it would actually I mean it would sort of you know the the, the bigger companies can also bear more costs. So that's a bit of a question whether that gets at the risk that you're thinking about. On the other hand, there's always problems with normalizing these figures because if you normalize by sales for example you know the sales also go up and down for all kinds of reasons so i don't think there's a good there's a clear answer which is better but i think it's always you know anyway it's important to be clear which one it is no exactly until we are we are good and then and then the sorting maybe should so maybe it is true then that the bigger firms enter one side of the portfolio, but maybe not the other one, right? So maybe that might happen, yeah. For instance, sort it down. But true, it's not, yeah, nothing that ensures it um, or excludes the possibility. True. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, so, anybody uh, who else has has questions, please please chime in now. I'll I'll have some backups, but I'd, I'd like to hear from from everyone in the call, of course. Uh, I had some uh, questions again. Sorry, just to jump in again, if that's okay. Uh, so, so the about that last issue just then, I was thinking of. Um, so, what would be a better measure then of transition risk? So, one thing might be to look at more forward-looking issues. So, uh, I mean, one thing is the uh, transition pathway initiative, where they look at like the firm targets. So, you could look at. Uh, okay, does okay? This firm has current emissions of X, but its its target is to be well below Paris Agreement, and so actually, is that a better pro better proxy for transition risk? And that's what investors care about, rather than today's emissions. Um, perhaps that will better capture it and deal with that issue of okay, we have emissions and we can weight it by sales or revenue or whatever. Um, and then with the forward-looking thing, perhaps um, I think it's really interesting to combine this textual information leading off of angle and combine it with other measures measures in your case it seems to me more like price crash risk so you sort of take these portfolio sorts and then if they drop by i think you said more by one, more than one standard deviation um so other ones you could maybe combine into that is maybe disclosure so i know uh, julian you look at disclosure um and that may be a, uh, an interesting measure to combine combine into this um and then, sorry, finally, the third point is, okay, you looked at one standard deviation away. I'm just curious if you look at more than that uh, for your measure of sort of crash, uh, crash <laughs> risk. That would be quite interesting. Yeah, so um, like regarding your, your third point, so we, we played around with, with uh, the like standard deviations and distances and so forth. Huh? So uh, like in the end, we took like just this one standard deviation and the results are actually fairly robust if we take like uh, a bit more, a little, little bit less or something like that. So yeah, um, the, uh, as, I, as I said, like crash, um, I mean, we look at like months in which our, our portfolio returns are like either above uh, the mean by one standard deviation or below. So I mean, it goes in both directions. So, um, yeah, but like, um, what was it like disclosure? So um, could you perhaps elaborate a little bit more? What, what, what do you mean? Yeah, so I was just thinking, so at the moment, uh, you sort of extended angle because you've gone, you've created like a two part measure. So you don't yeah. just have news, you have news plus market mm -hmm. reaction. Yeah. So perhaps you can make it a three way measure and have 
news market reaction firm disclosure or you could yeah. think about how firm disclosure comes in comes into this equation um of what is transition risk i think that that sort of answering that question is quite uh, important at the moment about what actually are we trying to measure okay so yeah. and i think this is a interesting contribution to that I mean, how would you, so I mean, again, so, I mean, so I guess one important thing is, I mean, we believe that transition risk is kind of latent, right? You cannot really measure it, but you can observe maybe changes in transition risk, right? But um, so, so this firm disclosure, so what would that in addition, so how, how, like, how can I, are these, maybe have to read more about it, but are these, yeah. So, so for the US, for example, uh, I mean, as I think there's more qualified people to talk about this, but the, in the risk factor section of the 10K, the annual report, they have to disclose their forward-looking risks. Increasingly, you find now they, they disclose climate change risks and they will say things like regulation and increased carbon pricing. So that is a proxy for forward-looking transition risk, um, mm -hmm. which could be they, used. But, but they should probably be, ref yeah, okay, okay. I think so here in this study, I mean, the interesting part for us was like really to observe that we can, that there are uh, effects on the real economy, right? That you somehow observe these aggregate effects, right? So because like, if you would think that firms are basically forward looking enough and policy is formulated in some forward looking way, we shouldn't see those adjustments, right? In a sense. So I think that's that's from our point of view, kind of, and for, for policymakers also, like kind of the interesting part of it that, that you can really see these costly adjustments somehow in, in, the, in the data. Yes, um, I, I think that was very interesting, but something I was very uh, quite curious is these effects seem very large. <clears throat> Just, you know, at first sight, I and. Mean, was it like 20% of industrial production or something like that? So it, it just seems massive. On average, how does this compare to other shocks? Um, so it's actually quite large. Um, so the thing is, so, so this excess bond premium, right? So if you take this as a shock measure, what people sometimes do, you get similar results. But uh, we basically see that our measure also lifts so explains part of the excess bond premium. So we believe that it's somehow reflected in the shock series as well, like shocks transition, like credit conditions change um, suddenly. And, and I guess the way we define it um, also um, 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 falls into this. So yeah, it's a high number. Um, we give this upper and lower bound, right? So because we also thought, okay, that's a very high number, but um, so then it's somewhere in the middle, right? The answer since, um, I mean, I mean, portfolio returns. So our layer of shock identification should make sure that it's somehow exogenous. Um, but yeah, we're as well puzzled, but I guess we, yeah, it's a financial shock in the end, right? So they have big real effects in the shorter run. The longer run effects are not so strong, right? So then it mm -hmm. dies out at some moment um, and it gets insignificant and so on. But um, but that's, yeah, but that's why we also looked at the sectoral level, like to yeah. really see if, if, like where it comes from. And I guess, but maybe then also your, like, maybe your story about the absolute, um, absolute, uh, 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 so non-adjusted um, carbon emissions, maybe that, that's one part of the story then. So if, if that's the case that we only identify the biggest ones and they, they are largely affected but then still i mean why would you see these um direct effects mm -hmm.